Hello, and welcome to Season 5 of the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. My name is Megan Rice, Communications Coordinator at Western Theological Seminary. The theme of this season is public theology, as we engage in dialogue about topics that affect both the church and society. Today's guest is Dr. Leah Gunning Francis. Dr. Francis is the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty at Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, Indiana. She is also the author of Ferguson and Faith, Sparking Leadership and Awakening Community, and this year's 2019 Stoudemire Lecturer in Multicultural Ministry. For Ferguson and Faith, Dr. Francis interviewed more than two dozen clergy and young activists who were actively involved in the movement for racial justice in Ferguson and beyond. She researched and wrote Ferguson and Faith while serving at Eden Theological Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Gunning Francis sat down with Dr. Kyle Small to discuss her time in Ferguson and what it means for the church to be engaged in the work of justice. Dr. Francis, it's so great to be with you today. Thanks for making time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've enjoyed reading your book and wondering about the questions of Ferguson that seemed like five years ago, but mm. they continue on today. And so if we can just have a discussion about what it means to be Christian leaders, the kind of work that you do in your book and what that means for leading the church and mission, I'd be grateful. That'd be fine. So, great. Thank you. So you, you say early on, um, as a practical theologian, I took up the work of looking for evidence of God's tenets of love, justice, faithfulness, and hope. And I want to tell and reflect on some of that story using the experiences of clergy and young leaders. Did you find evidences of faith and justice and hope? You know, I found that all over yeah. the place because in the midst of such an unfortunate tragedy yeah. that happened with the shooting death of Michael Brown in August of 2014, um, to see the response to that, that we will not look away from this. Mm. We will not just carry on with business as usual, that his mm. life mattered and so many people who find themselves um, in this situation, lives matter too. Mm. And so to see clergy and young people, you know, in the streets, being involved, saying we will not carry on with business as mm. usual, was something that you know I had not seen in my lifetime hmm. up until that moment for that to be happening in mass in that way. Hmm. And so Ferguson and Faith is an opportunity to hear some of the stories of people who were in these streets and who were actively engaged and to hear them articulate how this is an expression of their faith. Hmm. That yes, they were doing this because they believed that it was good and right, but also see the connection to this being about God's justice, hmm. that God does call us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And that requires that we leave our comfort zones oftentimes, that we, as we see in the book, where um, clergy people you know, left the pulpits, if you will, to stand in the streets and to lock arms with people and to hmm. provide um, constructive leadership. You know, these are the kinds of ways in which people see faith in action, yes. that it's not just a matter of prayer being a private and solitary act, that's all right, but at other times we need to yeah. be able to pray with our feet yeah. so that people see us putting the faith that we believe in into action. That's nice. I'll come back to something you said, but just on the prayer question, um, as I read the book, you, you Prayer is an active, <laughs> engaged, spiritual practice. Yes. And then I think about in the recent months, this hashtag thoughts and prayers, which is a pejorative use yeah. of the word prayer. And yeah. I, I just wonder, um, what is your word for the church in relationship to those two things? What prayer is and then what this kind of cultural question of thoughts and prayers is right, signaling. Right, right. You know, this prophetic word, mm. if you will, of the hashtag thoughts and prayers mm. is a reminder to all of us that thoughts and prayers are not an invitation to do nothing. Okay. And that's hence why the hashtag has come about because as we see in response to the many, many, many yeah. mass shootings that we've had and, and and shootings in, in many spaces, you know, so often the response is, oh, we're sending our thoughts and prayers. Mm. Well, that is not sufficient to bring an end to gun violence in this country and the proliferation mm. of guns. And so it is a call to say thoughts and prayers are not enough. It is about putting prayers into mm. action to bringing 
thoughtful responses yeah. into action. And this is what we saw happening all throughout the Ferguson mm -hmm. movement. And, you know, it's, it's, we say it's been five years, but as we were talking earlier, it feels like it's yesterday yeah. and the incidences continue. And um, I wonder, how, how are you seeing the movement that you saw from especially young leaders, but also clergy five mm -hmm. years ago? Where, where do you see that continuing even today amidst ongoing shootings and mass shootings? Mm -hmm. I see the movement continuing in many spaces in which they find themselves. Mm -hmm. You can see in the St. Louis metropolitan area where many of the grassroots community mm -hmm. organizations um, that were doing work long before Ferguson yeah. have found um, ways to continue that work in an expanded kind of way because they've been able to get additional, some of them have gotten additional resources and uh, support to be able to do their work in new ways. Um, I've seen how uh, people have worked hard to help connect uh, the dots to how these kinds of things happen and the ways in which systemic racism and injustice permeates um, across our society as a whole. So for example, uh, in St. Louis, mm -hmm. there is a very active Close the Workhouse campaign. You know, we can't talk about police officers outside of prisons and jails mm. and prosecute, you know, the entire mass incarceration system is one upon which a bright spotlight is shining. And so currently right now, there's a really important campaign in St. Mm. Louis to close the workhouse. What that is, it is a, a facility, a jail, where people are often hold sometimes for months and they haven't mm. even been charged with a crime. And they're only there because they can't afford the bail. Yeah. So the end cash bail movements, the close the workhouse movements, you know, these yeah. are all ways that, that the movement for racial justice um, has continued mm. uh, over the years. Wow. And you, you've mentioned PICO a little mm -hmm, bit. Mm -hmm. And PICO started in California, is that mm -hmm, correct? Mm -hmm. to, to say a little bit more about who PICO is and how you've seen them um, participate in the work that you deeply care about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I personally have learned so much from okay. them as a faith-based organizing organization mm -hmm. that is committed to um, engaging in acts of justice around the country. So not only you know are they 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 mm. loc they're located in, in California, but all over the country, yeah. and find ways to support uh, and and start local chapters in states and cities all around the country where you have opportunity to have people connect with these organizations and how they are connected with. Um, faith communities as well. Hmm. So to you know, have this organizing community that is inspired and infused yeah. with leadership uh, from faith communities and branching out around the country in that way has been really, really important hmm. because again, um, we have a responsibility as faith leaders, as clergy people, and as we think about formation yeah. in our communities of faith, that this is integral to what we say we believe. Yeah. That this is not um, an add-on. This is not hmm. something that, oh, if we feel like doing this, then you know perhaps we might look into it a little more. But rather, um, this is very consistent with our sacred texts, hmm. right? The yeah. Bible and others, our sacred texts in how we ought to be living in the world. Yeah. So you're a pastor and practical theologian, <laughs> and you're a seminary administrator. Um, what advice do you have for the formation of pastors and the formation of congregations? Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, that dismantling racism is an act of the white church. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, for multicultural churches, black churches, white churches, what word do you have to offer them in terms of moving with PICO or other organizations that congregations would be Mm -hmm. um, breaking the chains of racism. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you said, dismantling racism, white supremacy, mm. white privilege is white people's work to do. Yeah. I, as a black person, cannot do that work. And so as, as more and more congregations, particularly predominantly white congregations, are taking seriously the need to um, not only address racism, but learn what that is and how they're connected to it, you know, and how both individually as well as systemically, 
you know, mm. these things happen. So that's, that's an important role. And even as we think about multicultural churches, um, what does the leadership look like? Is it truly a multicultural church? Or are you saying it's a multicultural church because there are people of color in the congregation, but no people of color in leadership, no people of color influencing the worship, yeah. the worship style, the curriculum for the church. So, you know, how yeah. is it that we're looking into our congregations with a uh, much more sensitive eye toward how mm. racism, white supremacy is living out in this yeah. space? And remember that that's not your feel good, fuzzy work. <laughs> These aren't the kind of conversations yeah. that are gonna have everyone feeling like, oh yes, yeah. let's hustle and have this conversation today. But reminding people that this is a call that we mm -hmm. believe God calls us to if we're going to be serious about living yeah. into the command of loving your neighbor, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. We have a pretty checkered history in this country of that. And, but we also, also now have an opportunity to make corrections to that. Mm. But are we willing to take the steps to do it, to muster up the courage to yeah. do it, and sustain it for the long haul? Yeah. I've, I've been reading a little bit of Hannah Arendt, who mm. uses Augustine to talk about one of the powers of human agency is the principle of beginning. Mm. And, mm. and she talks about how God creates, and that beginning created a new world. And she says, both in the act of forgiveness and in promise keeping, mm. we can begin anew. Yeah. So I think. We're asking for a new world tomorrow. Yeah. And as, as we think about congregations, as we think about pastors, what are the kind of skills yeah. and habits and practices that leader, pastoral leaders need yeah. to, to even consider the possibility of a new beginning? Yeah. First, remembering that this is going to be wildly countercultural. Okay. You know, there are very little wider cultural supports for creating the world which you and I are sitting here seeking to, to map out. Um, that the dominant narratives about our world is, you know, you, everybody has an equal chance of success. All you need to do is pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you can be successful just like XYZ person over here. Well, we know that's not true. Uh, the playing field still is not level or equal. So that acknowledgement is really important that this is not um, what the work that you're doing and the vision that you're building is very countercultural mm. to a long and enduring narrative. Yeah. So with that, what are the skills that one needs? Number one, as I said, courage mm. to be willing to kind of go against the grain is and and not be um, you know flustered mm. by pushback against that. That's a really important skill that has to be cultivated. Second, the skills of listening. Mm. You now are going to have to take the time to hear of people's experiences and perspectives that you might not be accustomed yeah. to listening to and believing mm. and acting on mm. and empathizing with. So all of those kinds of skills coupled with the skills of building intentional relationships and, and, and uh, community mm. is an essential skill that you're going to need because one of the things we saw in Ferguson and Faith and still see to this day is that people, this is not a go it alone work. Mm. This is not, oh, I can just you know, put my knapsack on and do this all by myself. It's about joining the, in the work that God is already yeah. doing yeah. in this world to, toward building this vision. But you have to be willing to build those kinds of coalitions and bridges mm. and know how to do that. Yeah, I think when God decides to do work that's uncomfortable, I would prefer not to follow this quote. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. And once you've seen it, keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes as political an act as speaking out. That's from Arundhati Roy. Yes. But I think God's, God's doing work that isn't happy. Mm. God's right. doing work that's outrageous, right. lamentable, right. on the way towards reconciliation. Right. So I, when you say join in God's work, and then you said earlier, this isn't the happy, fluffy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just not sure how, how that's gonna work out. Yeah. But I'm trying to trust that leaders are formed for such a time as this. Absolutely, you know, yeah. what we have is what we have at mm. this moment, yeah. right? We are here 
on this earth, in this world, in a very particular time and space. It's incumbent upon us mm -hmm. to draw on the very best of our resources, our faith traditions, mm -hmm. our internal sensibilities to say, God, you know, I'm here now on mm -hmm. October 1st, 2019. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, I'm not here on October 1st, you know, 1519, it's yeah. 2019. How would you have me yeah. to join in what you are doing mm -hmm. at this particular time to bring about your justice yeah. in this world? You said 1519 and you could have picked 1619. Yeah. And I think about the, the moment at which America wanted to be created, it was created on the backs of slaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we have a 400 year history. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people say, well, if it's a 400 year history, to move forward is gonna take a lot of time. Mm. And that makes me outraged. Mm. It, 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 it is outrageous because yeah. what that is often said to say, well, you know, there's really no need to do anything because we have to go slow. slow. You know, we have to take our time. Change happens over time. Mm -hmm. And while, yes, there are changes that can happen over time, that's not an excuse mm. to change the things that we yeah. can change right here and now. Yeah. And so that is incumbent upon us mm. to say, we know the history. And for anybody who doesn't know the history or doesn't have a helpful and full explanation of the history, get to know it. Yeah and realize that there are steps that can be taken right now mm -hmm. that can help propel us into a future filled with hope. What are a couple of those steps? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can end there. Sure, sure. First thing, um, if you are part of a community, mm -hmm. um, especially let's, since we're talking about the church, let's yeah, just please. stay there for a moment. Um, for predominantly white churches, if you have not had sacred conversations around mm. race, if you have not, um, even within groups in the church, mm. begun to explore this more deeply to see how implicit bias, race, ra racism, white supremacy has infused our world as well as our churches, yeah. now's the time to mm. do that. A lot of people say, oh, you know, all the church wants to do is talk, 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 but it's been my experience that mm. many congregations haven't even talked about it. Yeah. So. Take the first courageous step mm. of saying, we need to talk about this. Yeah. Just as in our families, when we have a situation that might be uncomfortable that comes up and we really don't wanna deal with it, but we know that for the good and well-being of our yeah. family, we need to deal with it. We go and say to our loved ones, we need to talk. Mm. This is what we need to do in our, converse, in our congregations. We need to talk. Moving beyond that to then be able to say, now that we've become awakened and been able to see how racism has impacted us as individuals, as, as a collective, what are the ways in which we can seek to bring about change right here in yeah. our own communities? Yeah. You know, where, what, what are the issues that are facing our communities? How are people of color being treated in our communities? What are some of the records as it relates to who's being stopped by police and for what? Who's getting arrested? What are the school and suspension rates in our community? Who's being suspended and expelled and for what reasons? You know, find out, do the work of finding out what's actually happening yeah. in your communities, in your cities and then work to bring about how can we make this more equitable? How mm. can we seek to eradicate practices that are not um, in the best interests of, of all people? Mm. Mm. That's helpful. That last step to me, which could be a whole other conversation for yeah. us, is the practice of ethnography, qualitative research, phenomenology. Yeah. Just understand the lived experience in your yeah. community. Right. The way that you write about racism that we've talked today, you don't have to live in a special place to understand this. Right. It is permeating every inch of our creation in America. Everywhere, you know, over the years, people have said to me so many times, mm. oh, Dr. Francis, you know, our town, we're not like Ferguson. And my standard response is, Ferguson didn't know it was Ferguson until it became Ferguson. Mm. And I say that because, you know, so often we tend to want to mask mm -hmm. or pretend that certain issues yeah. and things aren't happening in the spaces in which we live simply because they're not happening to us. Mm -hmm. But it's time that we remove that mask, mm -hmm. that we wake up to the realities of mm -hmm. lived experiences of people right in our own yeah. communities and be willing 
to listen and act. That's helpful. Thank you for spending time at Western. Thank you for talking with me today. Thank you for having Peace me. To you. Blessings. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.